So today we'll be having a very interesting and important uh, uh, subject. Probably this is something the basic in critical care, the arterial blood gas analysis. And I know you are one of the instrumental teacher in teaching the students arterial blood gas analysis. So most of our students will be benefited from you, sir. Thank you. Let's hope so. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Ghosh. Hi, Dr. Aklesh. How are you? Hi. I'm fine. How about you? I hope good. Doing well. You are doing well. Yes, yes. Health-wise, a lot of viral infections. No, nah, doesn't. It usually <laughs> doesn't. It, these viral infections they do not affect these people who are born in villages. You know, I <laughs> think it's a disease of the city people. Yes, yes, yes. 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 This is my yeah. feeling. Yeah, I never, had, I never had COVID. My son had, my wife had. Okay. I, never, I never had any many symptoms, but I was right. like involved in COVID care. Okay. okay, okay. That's, <laughs> that's good to hear from you, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Because most of the intensivists, they are being affected. During yeah. The COVID. Mm -hmm. There are very few who actually race. got compared. Yeah. But, uh, have you checked your antibody levels? It must be elevated now. I have been vaccinated thrice. Okay, okay. okay. I don't know. I, a subclinical infection must have happened. I just cannot deny it. Right, right. Yes. So we have uh, 30 uh, our uh, uh, participant, or I can say the uh, students and fellows, co colleagues which, who have joined till now. We are expecting more. So uh, by the time uh, I'll start with the introduction. So I think many of them will be joining. So uh, can we can we st start with your yes, permission? Please, please, yeah. please, please. Yeah, I think we can. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I welcome you all. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Gunadhar uh, from Apollo Hospital, Navi Mumbai, Senior Critical Care uh, Consult, Senior Critical Care uh, Medicine Consultant. And uh, uh, today we have uh, our 29th Apollo. In Mumbai Clinic Critical Care Learning Network, which will be very interesting topic, and uh, it is one of the basic topic I can say for any of the critical care specialists, particularly for the students, the arterial blood gas analysis. And today we have a wonderful speaker with us, Dr. Supradeep. Dr. Supradeep Ghosh is uh, in charge, uh, head of the department, uh, Fortis Hospital, Faridabad, and a uh, lot of time I have heard of teaching this subject very enthusiastically and that's why I have invited him here to our forum. And welcome Dr. Supradeep Ghosh. Thank you. And uh, with and us, that my... Steward's principal. Yeah, we will be able to hear the steward's principal. Yes, steward's approach of acid-based uh, interpretation. Correct. And uh, today uh, with me, uh, Dr. Achilles uh, is my colleague, consultant, uh, critical care medicine. And uh, we have also our Dr. Sopnil, who is our junior consultant critical care medicine and our DNB fellows, Dr. Ashini. So uh, any questions, I request all the delegates to please put up in the chat box so that at the end of the talk, we'll be taking one of them one by one and we'll discuss and any doubts or any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, clarification they want they can put it on the chat box so, so that it will be easier for us. So without wasting any time, I welcome you all to this 29th episode of Apollo Mumbai Critical Care Learning Network. And uh, I request Dr. Ghosh to share his screen and to start the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gunadhar and Dr. Aklesh and colleagues for giving me this opportunity. As uh, we know, we shall be discussing on uh, arterial blood gas analysis through Stewart approach. If we uh, know that uh, mostly there are three approaches for analyzing arterial blood gas. The first one is of course the very traditional and uh, so-called physiological approach or what we call Henderson-Hasselbach approach, the most commonly used one. Then we have the approach which was uh, provided to us by the famous Sigurd Anderson or the base axis approach. And the third approach 
is what we call the physico-chemical approach, which was provided by Peter Stewart in 1970s. Now, all the three approaches, they actually are almost similar in their respiratory component. They differ significantly in their approach uh, regarding metabolic acid-based disorders. So we shall be discussing about the Stewart approach, but before we move on to Stewart approach, let us first try to understand why we need this approach why we should not be satisfied only with the traditional approach. And there are various reasons. I'm just trying to summarize a few points. First of all, the traditional approach is silent about mechanism of metabolic changes. Traditional approach tell us though, if this is metabolic acidosis, this is metabolic alkalosis, this is high end gap metabolic acid, but they fail to tell us why there is a metabolic changes, why the pH has changed to either decrease or increased. Secondly, in the traditional approach, it is, it is assumed that hydrogen ion concentration is directly changing and being responsible for manipulating the pH of the solution. Whereas Stewart says that hydrogen ion concentration changes are actually a result of different other changes. So hydrogen ion concentration changes are secondary to other changes. And it is rational also. Look at the concentration of hydrogen ion in, in, in body temperature in the plasma. It is 40 nanomole per liter, 40 nanomole per liter. Look at the water concentration in the plasma. This is 55.3 mole per liter. How can hydrogen ion individually or independently change its concentration on its own? It's not possible. What is the concentration of sodium? 140 millimole per liter. Hydrogen ion concentration, 40 nanomole per liter. So it's very, very irrational to assume that hydrogen ion concentration in plasma is directly manipulated on its own. Thirdly, we all understand that the assumption that bicarbonate ion is independently determining the metabolic component of acid-based balance is absolutely irrational. We all know bicarbonate ion is in equilibrium with carbon dioxide. How can both component be regulated by the same bicarbonate ion, metabolic and respiratory component. So this is again an irrational presumption. This henderson hasselbach approach doesn't tell us anything other than PSCO2 and bicarbonate buffer basis. It fails to tell us anything about the phosphate and the albuminate, which are very important components. Finally, it fails to give the clinician magnitude of changes in the metabolic component. It can just tell this is a metabolic acidosis, this is a metabolic alkalosis, but it cannot tell us how much is the actual value of metabolic acidosis, how much is the change in metabolic acidosis from the thing. So we started start assuming that, okay, bicarbonate is uh, 14, so it's a severe metabolic acidosis because normally it is 24. But these are uh, only assumption. Finally, let me tell you one more thing. All these calculations which we do for, uh, for this compensation mechanism, delta, delta, and N gap, delta, and N gap, all these things, all these calculations are based on healthy volunteer data and data derived from animal experiments performed in 1940s and 50s. So in extreme critical circumstances, in critically ill patients, Possibly many of these uh, um, formulae, the Winters formula and other formulae may not be valid. So we uh, do not know whether they are still valid in our severely ill, critically ill patients. That's the reason we need to have an approach which is, which is more scientifically based and which has got more um, um, solid uh, rationale behind it. That's the reason the, uh, the, the Canadian biophysicist, Peter Stewart, proposed this physical chemical approach in 1970s and his paper came out in 1978. 
I have a copy of this paper. If you want to see, you can, I can show you the, at the end of the things. So he stressed on three individual components, water, carbon dioxide, weak acids, and strong ions. So he said that these are the components which finally determines the pH and other things. So let's come to the Stewart approach directly. Before my dear friends and colleagues, before we move on to Stewart approach, I want you to forget about the Henderson Hasselbach equation for the time being. Please do not try to correlate Henderson Hasselbach with the Stewart approach. Then we will not be able to understand the things. Secondly, I want you to forget about all these fear factors. There is nothing to fear. Just try to understand the Stewart concept is based on uh, some few, you know, few, few scientific criteria. It says there are only three independent determinants of pH. Okay. The first determinant is something called total CO2 content. Total CO2 content is nothing but a sum of carbon dioxide, H2CO3, and bicarbonate. But for all practical purposes, it is nothing but the carbon dioxide, the PSCO2. Okay. So, first component which determines the pH independently is, of course, the respiratory component, that is total CO2. Second component, which is the most important component for metabolic acid based disorders, it is called strong ion difference. Now, for understanding strong ion difference, we need to understand the strong ions are substances that are derived, uh, that, uh, that, are, that, that completely get dissociated in the water. So these are the, these are the ions which are derived from substances that are completely dissociated in the water. For example, sodium chloride. It is completely dissociated in water to sodium and chloride. And strong ion difference is the difference between the sum of all strong cations, that is sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium, and sum of all strong anions. These are mostly chloride and to some extent lactate. So this is the most important component. And third independent determinant is something called A-tort. A-tort is the sum of all weak acids in undissociated and dissociated form. So this include albumin and phosphate. Albumin and phosphate in their ionic dissociated or undissociated form. Right? These are called a dot. So if you let, if you can uh, make it more simplified, so independent determinants of pH and acid-base disorders are PaCO2, differences between all strong cations and strong anions. That means all strong cations and strong anions, especially the sodium, potassium, and chloride. And finally, the a dot, or especially the albumin and the phosphate. I hope this is clear. Now coming to uh, some other terms, one term called apparent SID, another term is called effective SID. So forget about whatever is written in this slide. Just concentrate on the gamble gram in the right side of the slide. If you see the gamble gram, as per the principles of electroneutrality, all the positive cations must be equal, equal to the negative anions, okay? Now look at the gamble gram, follow my uh, the arrow. In, the, in the, this column, we have all the positive cations that include sodium plus potassium plus calcium plus magnesium. In the other side, in this column, we have predominantly chloride ion plus some unmeasured anion, some albumin, some phosphate, and some bicarbonate. Now, what is apparent SID? Apparent SID is the difference between sodium, that means this side, sodium plus potassium plus calcium plus magnesium minus the chloride. So it means all these additional things, including unmeasured anion plus albumin plus phosphate plus bicarbonate, these are actually constituting the apparent SID. What about effective SID? Effective SID is nothing but the phosphate, albuminate, and bicarbonate. So actually, this is, these are the two things. Now, 
effective SID and apparent SID. And the difference between apparent SID and effective SID is what we call SIG or strong AND gap. Now, this strong AND gap, if you can um, understand from it, strong AND gap is nothing but the unmeasured AND. Okay, let's recollect it again. Sodium plus potassium plus calcium plus magnesium minus chloride. This is your apparent SID. Whereas effective SID is nothing but bicarbonate plus phosphate plus albuminate. And the difference between these two is nothing but our unmeasured anion, which is also known as strong ion gap or SIG. I hope it is clear. Now coming to the, we talked about the SID, strong ion difference. What happens if the strong ion difference is decreased? Now, first of all, how can strong ion difference be decreased? Either the sodium must decrease or chloride should increase. Do you agree? SID can decrease only if the chloride ion and sodium ion, they move closer together. Either because the sodium ion has decreased because of the water excess, or chloride ion has increased because of the chloride excess, right? The other reason why the SID can decrease is because the unmeasured anion, that the lactate and beta hydroxybutyrate, they have increased in size or increase in amount, okay? So let's, uh, uh, so if suppose we have an SID which has decreased, SID has decreased. What happens to SID, this column has decreased in size. To maintain the electroneutrality, what will happen? This will contract the buffer base, the bicarbonate and this anion, this side. This side will decrease. This will result in a decrease in bicarbonate. That's what is what we see. We see that if we have a decrease in the SID, it automatically gives rise to a decrease in the bicarbonate. And opposite occurs when there is an SID is increased. There, the bicarbonate goes up. I hope it is clear. Otherwise, we can discuss it in later stage. What happens if the A dot is changed? A dot. What it is what? This phosphate and albumin. Suppose the A dot has increased in size. Suppose the albuminate has increased in size. Sodium is constant, chloride is constant. That what will happen? It will, it will, the A dot is increased in size, so it will push the bicarbonate further down, resulting in metabolic acidosis. So A albumin is increased, leads to metabolic acidosis. Similarly, phosphate is increased, it leads to metabolic acidosis. Opposite occurs when the A dot decreases. That's the reason we get metabolic alkalosis when there is a low albumin in our critically in patients, okay? And how the pH changes? pH changes because of the SID distortion. The distortion of SID changes the dissociation equilibrium of the water, water plus carbon dioxide and albumin itself. This results in an imbalance between hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion resulting in a change in pH. When the hydrogen ion concentration is more than the hydroxyl ion concentration, we call it acidosis. When the hydrogen ion concentration is less than the hydroxyl ion concentration, we call it alkalosis. I hope it is not confusing. Now let's make it more simplified. Simplistically speaking, we let's try to remember that only there are only four independent variables which determine the as a metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. These are SID, PaCO2, albumin, and phosphate. If the SID increases, this produces alkalosis. If the PaCO2 decreases, it produces alkalosis. If the albuminate decreases, it produces metabolic alkalosis. If the phosphate decreases, it produces metabolic alkalosis. The opposite is true. If the SID goes below 38 milliequivalent per liter, 
that produces metabolic acidosis. If the bicarbonate goes above 42 millimole, millimeter mercury, produces respiratory acidosis. If the albumin goes more than 4.2 gram per liter, this produces acidosis and phosphate more than three milligram per deciliter, this produces acidosis. Rest all are dependent variables. Whatever bicarbonate, pH and base axis, these are all dependent variables. So it's very simple, very simple. And this way we can actually classify our acidosis. So if we go for acidosis, let's see, let's take an ABG. If the ABG shows a pH of less than 7.38, according to Stewart, it can have only two reasons. Either a, there's a, it's a metabolic problem or a respiratory problem. If there is a respiratory problem, the PSCO2 should go more than 42 millimeter of mercury. If there is a metabolic problem, it can be either because there is a decrease in the SID or there is a non-volatile acid increase. That means either the albuminate is going up or the phosphate, it is absolutely the opposite. Albumin is going low and phosphate is uh, going low. That will produce the problem. In, in contrast, the SID can decrease either because the sodium ion has decreased or the chloride ion has gone up. So these are the things which can produce metabolic acidosis and respiratory acidosis. In contrast, in case of alkalosis, it can again have either metabolic or a respiratory component. If the PSCO2 is low, it is metabolic respiratory alkalosis. If the metabolic alkalosis is there, either the SID is increased or the non-volatile weak acids are increased. I hope it is uh, not confusing. Any comment from the students? No, no, I think it is, uh, uh, it's not confusing. It's, it's clear. Yeah, it's very, so, very clear. So, students can keep the questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. I think there are no questions. We can go ahead and once the questions are there, we will definitely answer. When, when student has uh, written confused a bit, Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, that so is what, I, what I request, Dr. Supradeep, just the main thing, the strong ion difference, can you again, suppose uh, a little bit elaborate, so that is the center point of discussion in every steward's approach, Yeah. So then they will be more clear, strong ion difference. Yeah. So, yes, yes. The strong ion difference is, uh, let's try to understand what is strong ion. Strong ions are the, sub, are the ions which are derived from substances which are completely dissociated in the water. That, uh, these are the ions uh, which can be mostly sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and chloride. Okay, So these are completely dissociated in water and they are the strong ions. Now out of the strong ions, some are positive ions which are the strong cations, and there are some ions which are negative ions, these are strong anions. The difference between the strong cations and strong anions is the strong ion difference. Now, for all practical purposes, if you, if you allow me, the most strong ions are the sodium as cation and chloride as anion. Because potassium, calcium, and magnesium, these are very tightly regulated by the body. So what is changing actually is mostly the sodium and chloride. And if you can, uh, if you can recall, the normal sodium value is around 140 and normal chloride value is around 100. So difference between sodium and chloride are the most important determinant of SID. So normal SID we can presume is around, around 40 or maybe around 38 milliequivalent per liter, sodium minus chloride. Now, if the SID decreases, SID comes closer, sodium and chloride, they come closer, the SID decreases, that produces acidosis as per the Stewart concept. So, if there is a decrease in the sodium value or an increase in the chloride value, the sodium and chloride, they come closer together and SID decreases, that produces acidosis. This is what we see after giving sodium chloride infusion. 
The sodium and chloride in the plasma, they come closer together and they produce so-called hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. In contrast, if there is uh, the difference between sodium and chloride goes apart. So either because the sodium has increased because of the hypernatremia or chloride has gone down because of loss of chloride, like after vomiting. You have a multiple episodes of vomiting, the chloride is lost. The difference between sodium and chloride goes apart, more than 40, maybe 50, more than 60 milligrams per liter. That produces alkalosis. I hope now it is clear. The difference between sodium and chloride when they come closer together, this produces metabolic acidosis. When the difference goes more than 40, maybe 450, because of hypernatremia or because of hypochloremia, this produces metabolic alkalosis, okay? So this is the main and most important things about the SID. There is question why yeah. bicarb is not strong iron. Okay. Bicarbonate is not a strong iron because they are never completely dissociated with the, in the water. Bicarbonate is attached with the CO2 producing H2CO3 or bicarb or H2O on CO3, they, they produce um, a plethora of compounds. So they are never a completely dissociated. Sodium bicarbonate is never, uh, sodium bicarbonate is completely dissociated because there is a sodium. But bicarbonate, hydrogen bicarbonate, H2CO3 is never completely dissociated to hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. So this is not a strong ion. Lactate in turn is a strong ion. But lactate, because of a very minuscule amount presence in the, uh, in, the, in the plasma normally, less than one millimole per liter, they, are, uh, they can be actually avoided for the purpose of calculation. Okay? Yes. So if I can just make a comment here, the SID is one of the uh, important questions for most of the exams. Yeah. The examiner tend to ask, and it is the center point of discussion. So this concept is only in Stewart's approach, I think. So yes. Anderson, Nesselbach, and the no, traditional no, approach don't no, have this SID. No, 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 it doesn't give. Uh, so basically, uh, SID is a very simplified concept. So uh, there are, again, if we can, uh, there are three important variables which independently determines the acid-base changes in the plasma, according to Stewart approach. Number one is what we call total CO2. The total CO2 includes bicarbonate also. PaCO2 plus bicarbonate plus H2CO3. But again, for all practical purposes, we can forget about H2CO3 and bicarbonate. So it is the most important determinant is the PaCO2. If the PaCO2 is low, we call it respiratory alkalosis. If the PaCO2 is more, it is what we call it uh, respiratory uh, I, mean, I mean, I mean, the other way around. If the PSCO2 is less than 38, it is a respiratory alkalosis. If the PSCO2 is more than 42, it is respiratory acid. It is just like Henderson Hasselbach and just like uh, Sigard Henderson. Only thing is that in Stewart approach, we don't calculate whether it is uh, the whether um, there is a second disorder or not. It is straight away. PSCO2 is less than 38, respiratory alkalosis. PSCO2 is more than 42, respiratory acidosis. Whereas the metabolic component has got two reasons. Either there is a change in the SID. As I said, if the SID is low, lower than normal, it produces acidosis. If it is higher than normal, it produces alkalosis. Or it is because of non-volatile weak acid, what we call A-tot. Now again, all practical purposes, the most important determinant of A-tot is albuminate. Albumin is present in the largest amount. So if the albumin concentration is high, this produces what you call um, uh, uh, acidosis, what you call metabolic acidosis because of high albumin. In contrast, if the albumin is low, then it produces alkalosis. So this is the simplified Stewart concept. I hope it is clear, Dr. Gunadhar. Yes, yes, fabulous. Yes. Yeah, let's go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> now, simplistically, we don't have to do any calculation for Stuart approach. Absolutely nothing. 
you pick up the ABG, you see that pH is less than 7.38, you know that this is acidosis. Now you have to find out what is the reason for acidosis. Now you look for the, uh, your, your ions, all your uh, biochemistry values. If you find your patient's sodium is low, that you know that this is probably one of the reasons for acidosis. Or you find the chloride is high, this is another reason for producing metabolic acidosis. Or you find your albumin is uh, high, this is also another cause of metabolic acidosis. If you find the phosphate is high, this is the cause of metabolic acidosis. These are the independent determinants. So you don't have to do any calculation for this. But if you still want to do a calculation, there are different approaches for doing calculations. If you are so fond of doing calculations, because we are used to doing calculations for Henderson SL, but so we are very fond of doing calculations. So these, one of the calculations which are being provided is uh, what you call the fankel stewart approach, where uh, th these are the complicated things. There are multiple calculations. So as I said, uh, sodium ion concentration is a determinant of um, metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. If the sodium ion is high, it will produce metabolic alkalosis. If the sodium ion is low, it will produce metabolic acidosis. Okay, sodium ion jada hai. If the sodium ion is high, SID is white and this produces metabolic alkalosis. If the sodium ion is low, SID is low because sodium and chloride is coming closer together. So this produces metabolic alkalosis. So we can just simplistically see the sodium ion. If the sodium ion is anything above or below 142 milliequivalent per liter, then we call it water excess or water deficient. If there is an water excess, that means sodium is low, it produces metabolic acidosis. If there is a water deficit, that is sodium is high, then it produces metabolic alkalosis. Now, don't get confused again. Yes, we can take the questions later. A yeah. few I'll just uh, clarify yeah. once because I know yeah. this is a problem students face. Sodium ion disorders are actually disorders of water. Okay. So if there is a hypernatremia, it actually means water deficit. So water deficit will produce hypernatremia resulting in metabolic alkalosis. Whereas hyponatremia is actually water excess. The hyponatremia or water excess will produce low sodium leading to low SID and metabolic acidosis. So that's the reason I'm telling a water excess and water deficient. Second component according to this concept is the chloride. Okay, now chloride needs to be corrected from the, uh, with the, from the sodium value, according to this formula, whatever chloride corrected is equal to nothing but the chloride observed into sodium ion normal, that is 142 divided by sodium ion observed. So if the chloride corrected is anything changed from 102, 102, if the chloride is high, what will happen? The sodium and chloride will come closer together the SID will reduce, leading to metabolic acidosis. So if your corrected chloride is more than 102, that means there is a metabolic acidosis because of hyperchloremia. Similarly, if your normal, if your corrected chloride is less than 102, that means the, there is a metabolic alkalosis because of hypochloremia, what we see frequently after frequent episodes of vomiting. Similarly, Frankel and Lake has given a calculation for albuminate as given in the formula. Albuminate is nothing but 0.28 into albumin in gram per liter, whereas phosphate is 0 0.6 into phosphate in milligram per deciliter. So these are the formulae which needs to be remembered if you are so fond of doing calculations. Otherwise, simplistically, you can go ahead with just sodium chloride and albumin. SID can be calculated from this formulae, bicarbonate plus albumin plus phosphate. As I say, this is the effective SID, not apparent SID, this is the effective SID. Whereas unmeasured anion also can be calculated from sodium plus potassium plus calcium plus magnesium and this formula, which normal range is eight plus minus two. I hope it is uh, clear. I'll go for some examples. I would like to take some questions, Dr. Party, because uh, I, I know this is confusing. 
Yeah, there are questions so in I the chat box. Can I take so these I questions? Go. Yeah. So as I can see, uh, I hope it is clear now, students, why the bicarbonate is not a strong ion. I explained bicarbonate is not yeah. a strong because they are never completely dissociated. In the alkalosis yeah. slide, albumin and phosphate are shown high for metabolic alkalosis. Okay. This is a, I, I, I agree with you. This is, a, uh, this is a mistake. Metabolic alkalosis is produced by low albumin and low phosphate. This is a mistake. This is, I completely agree with you. And I, uh, I agree with Usha. She has rightly said that in this alkalosis slide, albumin and phosphate are shown high, whereas it should have been shown low. So metabolic alkalosis can be produced I only know. when the albumin is low or phosphate is low. Finally, the slide reflects albumin, if increased, causes alkalosis, which is contradictory. I do agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. These were uh, some mistake because during making the slides, if the albumin is increased or phosphate is increased, they produce metabolic acidosis. If the albumin is decreased and phosphate is decreased, they produces independently metabolic alkalosis. I hope it is clarified. Yogendra. Okay, Usha, thank you. Thank you. So uh, students for your understanding, these formulae are important. I'm not denying that, but for all practical purposes, we actually for in the in the in the clinical practice, we don't have to go for formulae. We just have to see whether the sodium is high or sodium is low, chloride is high or chloride is low, albumin is high or albumin is low, CO2 is high or CO2 is low. That's it for Stewart approach. You can straight away say this. But if you still want to use the uh, formulae, these are the formula available. Now let's uh, tell about, uh, talk about some real patients. These are patients from my IC. Okay. So let's take the first case scenario. 46 year old male, chronic liver disease, admitted with variceal bleeding. So, uh, uh, so uh, this patient is really sick, really, really sick. But if you look at the ABG, ABG showed a pH of 7.4, PaCO2 of 39, bicarbonate of 24, and base axis of zero. So my dear friends, what is your opinion from the Henderson and Hasselbach approach? So I just want a quick comment from one or two. Yeah. What do you Normal. think? Uh, using your Henderson, Hasselbach, uh, so for, uh, yeah, it is. it looks normal. But can you believe a normal? Okay, Rishikesh has answered normal. Santosh has answered normal. Usha has also answered normal. Yeah, let's. Do it. it looks normal because sodium, the pH is normal, PCO2 is normal, bicarbonate is normal, base axis is normal. But can you believe a sick patient like this will can have, can have a normal acid base? Uh, acid base, uh, absolutely normal acid base uh, things, not possible. Not possible. Now, look at the uh, now one way to solve this um, uh, so, uh, uh, thing is uh, we can actually go for calculate an anion gap. Sometimes we see that all pH, PCO2, bicarbonate, everything is normal, but anion gap is elevated. Let's calculate the anion gap. So, this is the bi uh, biochemistry sodium is 125. Potassium is 5.2, chloride is 98, and you have a, okay. So uh, can anyone calculate the anion gap for me? Sodium 125, potassium 5.2, chloride 98, and bicarbonate we know is 24. Can anyone do it for me, please? 23. Yeah, so if we can, if we take uh, potassium into consideration, it will be different. Let's let's not take potassium into consideration. Let's calculate sodium, 125 plus uh, uh, minus uh, chloride plus bicarbonate. That comes around um, 22, three, three. Now we have to go for albumin correction. 
How do you correct that, Bumin? Yeah. Which albumin can be corrected by 0.25 into 4 minus 1.3. So this comes around 23. Again, uh, that's not correct. Anyone can calculate it for me? 4 minus 1.3 into point. 6.75. Anybody? So this is also almost normal, looks normal. So even albumin is not going to help. Now let's apply the Stewart approach. What we can see directly from here, the sodium is low. Sodium is low. Sodium low means there is a metabolic acidosis. Look at the chloride. Chloride is almost normal. But if you go for the corrected chloride, maybe it will be a little change. Look at the albumin. Albumin is 13 gram per liter, 1.3 gram per deciliter, which is low. So this produces metabolic alkalosis. Look at the phosphate. Phosphate is 0 0.9. Again, it is low. It produces metabolic alkalosis. So we have multiple disorders low sodium leading to metabolic acidosis, high low albumin and low phosphate leading to metabolic alkalosis. These are actually counterbalancing each other and producing a not apparently normal acid base, uh, acid base uh, values. So uh, this is how the steward is going to help. A sick patient, critically ill patient can never have a normal acid base. So if you go purely by henderson hesselbach or by sigard henderson method, you will be missing these acid-base disorders. And this can easily be found out only by looking at the biochemistry. Low sodium, low albumin, and low phosphate, which are counting, counterbalancing each other. Yeah. 13, 30, albumin is written as 13. 13 is 13 gram per liter. So that means 1.3 gram per deciliter. I hope it is clear, Pratik. Yeah. So this patient has multiple disorders. Yes. Metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. And this can easily be, uh, just by looking at the biochemistry, you can easily decipher the things. You don't have to go for any calculation. But if you still insist on some calculation, these are the calculated values. By following the Fankel and Leth formula, we could find out that albuminate is 3.64, which is low. SID is 28.54, again low. And this SID is low because the sodium is low and chloride is slightly higher. This is the corrected chloride. I said the corrected chloride is the chloride, which is there into the current bicarbonate, current sodium divided by I mean, this, this is how you calculate the corrected product and go for the, this corrected product is around 111, which is much more than the normal product of 102. So you have a SID, which is low because of low, both low sodium and high chloride, low sodium and high chloride, which is exactly counterbalanced by low albumin and low phosphate, simple. So the, so the beauty of this uh, Stewart's approach is actually whatever we, are, we cannot pick up by the traditional approach. Yes. By the Henderson Hesselbach or uh, your traditional approach is you can actually pick up this mixed disorders or triple disorders or double disorders by this applying this formula on the Stewart's approach. Yeah. And actually, practically, you don't have to use the formula. So nobody is going to ask you the formula. You, have, you can easily find out the, the problems by looking at the biochemistry. The sodium is low, the albumin is low, the phosphate is low. These are the directly responsible for producing acid-base abnormalities. So why so do we need a formula? We don't need a formula. So if I give weight test to two most important, uh, you know, electrolytes in the whole concept is sodium and chloride. Correct. Yes. That we need Phos to understand. Practically sodium, chloride and albumin, that's it. 
even phosphate is not required. We don't need calcium, magnesium, all these things. These are actually for more complicated things. But right. simplistically, you just need sodium and chloride. If any patient has got a high sodium or low chloride, there is a metabolic alkalosis. Low sodium, high chloride, metabolic acidosis. Similarly, if there is a high albumin, metabolic acidosis, low albumin, metabolic alkalosis. Correct. Let's take one more example. So if the sodium and chloride, they goes in the same direction, probably the, the changes, what we can observe is... Counterbalanced. It will be counterbalanced. Counterbalanced. If, if the sodium also is goes down, sodium goes down, sodium goes down means there is a tendency for metabolic acidosis. Chloride also goes down, there is a tendency for metabolic alkalosis. So they will, this will actually counterbalance each other. But clinically, we hardly get this type of scenario. We hardly get a low sodium and low chloride both. Uh, but we usually get low sodium and high chloride. Let's see one more case scenario. So this is the complete steward. And this is uh, the, uh, this. So this patient had a low SID acidosis because of water excess plus high corrected chloride. Exactly matched by the hypoalbuminic plus hypophosphatemic alkalosis. That's the reason you got all values normal, pH, PCO2, bicarbonate, everything was normal because these were all derived values. These were all dependent values. So these were all found to be normal. Now coming to one more uh, simple case. Again, it's all my patients, 45 year old male, ileal perforation, post-operative with multiple organ failure. Let's see the ABG. ABG showed a pH of 7.33. PSCO2 of 30, bicarbonate of 15, and base axis of minus 10. Here, even Sigurd Anderson is picking up, there is some problem. Sigurd Anderson is telling us that base axis is minus 10, that this patient has got a metabolic acidosis. Now, can anyone of my friends can find out what is, uh, what is your take home from the uh, henderson hasselbalch equation? What do you think? The pH is 7.33, PCO2 is 30, and bicarbonate is 15. So what are we dealing with? So it's a, Santos has written it is a metabolic acidosis. I think it's right. Look, looking at the ABG. Okay. So, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Santosh, uh, oh, I, am, I, am, I am happy that you have rightly mm -hmm. said. So there is a more significant change in the um, bicarbonate. So primarily it's a metabolic acidosis. Now we have to do a calculation. The, follow the winter formula, 1.5 into bicarbonate plus 8. What should be the expected PCO2? Santosh ji, I have a calculator with me and I can say 1.5 into 15 plus 8. So that is 30.5. Santosh is right. So this patient has got a uh, metabolic acidosis and appropriately compensated PCO2. Now, what is the type of metabolic acidosis, Santosh? Sodium is 117, chloride is 92, and bicarb is 15. So that means sodium minus chloride minus bicarbonate. That is around 10. And we have to correct it with 0.6, this uh, albumin. 4 minus 0.6 into 10. Yeah. How much? So it is around 18. 18. So corrected anion gap. So it's a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Purely. Santoji, what do you think? Yeah, he has replied on the same. High anion gap metabolic acidosis. Yeah. So great. So it's a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Let's see the steward. Steward, we do, uh, uh, but bahut complicated. Nahi lagta hai. Aapko, uh, we had to do so many calculations, you winter's formula, whatever. We need to correct it. That. Now let's apply the steward. Simple steward at the bedside. You don't have to go for any calculation. Look at the sodium. Sodium is 117, which is low, which is pretty low. So 
there is low sodium means there is a metabolic acidosis. Look at the chloride. Chloride is 92. We need to correct it. Correct it. We'll correct it from the place. Look at the albumin. Albumin is only 6 gram per liter. That means 0.6 uh, gram per deciliter. So which is significantly low. And this is a very common thing in critical care. A majority of our patients are hypoalbuminic. So this low albumin, as we know, low albumin will produce metabolic alkalosis. So there is uh, directly we can say by just looking into the bio biochemistry, th this patient has got uh, metabolic acidosis because of low sodium and metabolic alkalosis because of the high, uh, the low albumin and low phosphate also. At the same time, this patient has got a respiratory alkalosis because the PCO2 is low. Here, unlike the Unlike the henderson hasselbalch equation, where we don't find any respiratory alkalosis because we follow that Winters formula, Stewart says this patient has got three different acid-base disorder. PCO2 is low. This is respiratory alkalosis. Sodium is low. This is metabolic acidosis. And albumin is low. This is metabolic alkalosis. Just simply by looking into the parameters. No calculation, nothing. Now, if you still want to go for calculation, these are the calculated values for you. For the same patient, we have an albuminate of 1.68, which is low, alkalinizing, SID of 17.28, low, acd water excess because of the low sodium, high chloride corrected. So these are the two things which is produced, acidosis, alkalinizing, albumin is low and phosphate is low. Unmeasured anion is high, so 18 millivolts per liter, so it's acid fine. So it's a mixed disorder. And final composite uh, diagnosis is, is the both low SID and high uh, unmeasured anion acidosis, partially offset by hypoalbuminic metabolic alkalosis. So you can calculate using the Frankel and Leith formula. Okay? Any comment? My dear students. No, I just uh, request uh, to share after this lecture in the chat box if all these formulas mm -hmm. are you uh, so that uh, they can just note down in uh, you know, one page. No problem. Yeah, or otherwise if the PowerPoint can also be shared. Yeah, yeah. It is feasible. But, um, but I strongly discourage students not, uh, for real practical purpose not to use this formula. <laughs> because the beauty of Stewart approach is not to use formula. This is the most beauty. Using formula again, we are uh, we are trapped in the same Henderson Hasselberg problem. The beauty is uh, you can simplify, simplistically find out the uh, acid-base disorder by looking into the sodium chloride and albumin. That's it. Okay, I'll go for. Um, we have time, then we can go for one more case. Yeah. yeah. So are there conditions where the sodium is normal, but there is still metabolic acidosis? Even yeah. chloride is normal. Yeah. Sodium is normal, but chloride is high. It will produce metabolic acidosis. You know, if both sodium and chloride are normal, are there and conditions? Uh, al albumin is... Albumin, albumin is or phosphorus. Is, yeah, albumin high. is high or phosphate is high. It will produce metabolic acidosis. And the second, second thing, what uh, most of them are interested to know, whether it can differentiate between high NN gap, metabolic acidosis versus normal NN gap. By so this, this concept of high NN gap and meta, uh, non, normal NN gap acidosis is only for Henderson and Hasselberg. So there is no such concept in Stewart's approach. There is no such concept in Stewart. But you can, uh, you can have something called unmeasured NN or strong ion gap. As I explained initially, the apparent SID and effective SID, the difference between apparent SID and effective SID is nothing but uh, nothing but practically the high causes of high and gap metabolic acidosis. So SIG is closely related to the causes of high and gap metabolic acidosis. But we don't have any concept of high and gap, normal and gap, all these things. So right. we straight away just say there is a metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. So whatever the approach they follow, if the, like Henderson's, they have to quote that this is, a, is for the Henderson equation, this is for the Stewart's equation. But both the approaches should lead to the same concept. 
yes. whether it is acidosis or alkalosis. Yeah, ultimately we are interested whether there is acidosis or alkalosis or not. We are not interested in uh, high NN gap normally. This is the artificial calculation we have created. And the causes will also remain the same. Yeah, SIG causes will remain the same. Okay, so let's see this 72 year old female patient post cardiac arrest, arrest hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. pH is 7.55. PCO2 is 29, bicarbonate is 25.5, and base axis is plus 2. What do you think, students, from Henderson Hasselbach? So pH is high, PCO2 is low. So there is a uh, respiratory alkalosis. And this is probably an acute respiratory alkalosis. So apply your formulae and find out whether the bicarbonate is appropriate or not. Yeah. So bicarbonate looks appropriate. Okay. There is slight elevation of the bicarbonate. So this is according to the Henderson Hasselbach equation, it is purely respiratory alkalosis. Base X is also plus two. But this is very unusual for a patient of hypoxic brain damage not to have some metabolic component. It is just not possible. So look at the bio biochemistry. Sodium is 159. So according to Stuart, sodium 159 means sodium is high. The strong ion difference is, uh, uh, is, is a uh, wide strong ion difference. So patient must have this metabolic alkalosis. But can you imagine uh, having a patient with only ischemic, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy without involvement of other organs, it's not possible. So this is unusual that a patient can have only respiratory alkalosis. So from Stewart, we can easily say sodium jada hai, sodium is high, so there is a metabolic alkalosis. Chloride is high, there is a metabolic acidosis. Albumin is 0 0.9, so there is a metabolic alkalosis, and so on and so forth. If you want to calculate, so these are the formula applied. Again, I'm not very fond of calculation. Agar calculate karna tha, to doctor thori banna tha. Eh? So you can easily find out these are the, uh, according to the Frankel and Lake formula, I'll share the formula with uh, you people, if you insist. And finally, it is an al alkalosis due to water deficit and hypoalbuminemia, which is offsetting the effect of high anion gap high uh, uh, unmeasured anion acidosis. So this is how you can calculate the case. Okay, students. Yes, Santosh, metabolic alkalosis is low water, metabolic acidosis is, uh, metabolic alkalosis is low water and metabolic acidosis is high water. Yeah, water excess. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. If you read this book, you will definitely find all these approaches. Otherwise, I'll share. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, this book has uh, all these formulae. Yeah, yeah. So there are one question, like uh, do we apply this approach uh, to change the treatment strategy uh, when compared to the classic henderson Hasselbach equation? <laughs> Can it change your management plan? Yes. Henderson has said, but how it is going to change your management plan? Like, uh, suppose uh, they classify whether it is a normal NN gap, hyperchloremic acidosis, or... Suppose it's a normal NN. Suppose it is a normal NN gap acidosis. What are we going to do about it? Nothing. Practically nothing. For Practically for the acidosis part, we are not going to do anything. We are trying to find out if there is a normal anion gap acidosis, then we try to find out urinary anion gap or potassium value and try to find out if there is a type 1 disorder, type 1 renal tubular acidosis, type 2 renal tubular acidosis, or type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Or we try to find out whether there is a drug responsible, for example, type 2 renal tubular acidosis because of amphotericin B. So we try to remove the amphotericin B if it is possible. So we are not directly treating the acidosis or alkalosis. We are treating the cause behind the acidosis and alkalosis. It is true for us also. We are strong and difference. If we can find out the metabolic acidosis is metabolic acidosis is because of high chloride. 
So we'll try to reduce the sodium chloride component in fluid. We try to find out the metabolic alkalosis is because of low chloride. Then the treat it with chloride containing fluid. And I'll tell you one more thing which Stuart can easily tell us. Now tell me one thing, um, what will happen to, um, uh, to a healthy human being if he or she is infused with two liters of 5% dextrose? What will, will there be any acid-based changes? Student, you can reply. If a healthy volunteer is infused with two liters of 5% dextrose, what will happen to the acid base? Santosh. Metabolic acidosis. Santosh, can we explain how? Okay. The, here answered rightly. So there is a, uh, this is a simplified things. If, yeah, Santosh, you can answer. Yeah, he has rightly told which can cause hyponatremia because the free water get, uh, you know, the, that dextrose okay. get metabolized and it causes. I, 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 I hats off. Uh, great. But I'll tell you a more simplistic formula. Whenever you are infusing a patient with any IV fluid or any individual with IV fluid, you just need to see the strong iron content of that IV fluid. Even the IV fluid, like for example, so, uh, if you uh, give 0.9% saline, what is the strong ion difference of 0.9% saline? It is zero. So sodium minus chloride is zero. Sodium content of sodium chloride is 154 millicolon per liter. Chloride content is 154 millicolon per liter. So difference between these two is zero. Similarly, 5% dextrose has got a strong ion difference of zero because sodium content is zero, chloride content is zero. So if you infuse any fluid, which has a strong ion difference less than 24. This will produce metabolic acidosis. Or if you infuse any fluid which has an SID less than the bicarbonate of the patient, this will produce metabolic acidosis. In contrast, if you infuse any fluid which has an SID more than the bicarbonate of the patient, this will produce metabolic alkalosis. For example, I'll give you an example. We have a patient uh, who, who has a bicarbonate of 20, okay? You infuse the patient with two liters of ringal lactate. What will happen? Ringal lactate has an SID of 27, okay? So 27 is more than the bicarbonate of the patient. Two liters of SID, two liters of uh, ringal lactate infusion will produce metabolic alkalosis to this patient. But same ringal lactate, if you infuse to a patient who has got a bicarbonate baseline, for example, a patient has a COPD. Baseline COPD, COPD patient has got a high bicarbonate. So patient has a COPD patient has a bicarbonate of say 36. I'm just giving an example. 36, you infuse this patient with uh, two liters of ringal lactate. Ringal lactate has, an, has a SID of 27, which is less than 36. Now, this time, ringa lactate is going to produce metabolic acidosis to this patient. So, ringa lactate is going to reduce the bicarbonate content of the patient as per Henderson and Selberg. So, this is so simplistically, Stuart can tell us what will be the effect of a particular intravenous fluid on the patient. Correct. Let's see the SID of the solution. An SID of the solution will tell, and you know the bicarbonate of the patient, and it will tell you what will be the effect after a liter or two liters of fluid. That's the simplistically why sodium chloride is producing and causing the problem. So uh -huh. this is definitely changing the practice because next time whenever we give the fluid, so we have to look at the SID rather than the electrolyte content of sodium and chloride. Yeah. This, this is a uh, this is a concept where actually we know whether the patient is going to be acidotic or patient is going to be alkalotic. Very important uh, take home message. I, I'll, I'll tell one more example, Gunadar, if you allow. Sure, sir, uh, please. Uh, 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 yeah. What will happen to a patient who has an artificial bladder, you know, um, uh, CA, uh, CA urinary bladder, 
and the uh, this they they form this artificial bladder and this ureter is implanted in that uh, bladder that they form this from the ileal conduit the the with the bladder the surgeons and the ureter is implanted to that now what what will happen to the after the, what we call ureter or sigmoidostomy or whatever what will happen to the patient what is the acid base impact of this patient and how you can explain it Now, urine, urine contains a lot of chloride. The patients will have normal and iron gap metabolites. And how? Because of um, the bicarb uh, loss. Yes. So I'll tell you a different concept. Let's see. Uh, normally, we have a lot of chloride in the urine. This chloride doesn't get absorbed from the urinary bladder. True. Now, if you implant that bladder, uh, that, ureter, uh, that, that ureter in the sigmoid, sigmoid colon, what will happen? Whatever chloride is there in the, in the urine, this will get reabsorbed from the sigmoid colon, producing transient hyperkalemia. Hyper now, we know that hyperchloremia produce, is produ uh, it produces low strong ion difference and metabolic acids. So this is another way of explaining the things from simplistically from Stewart. No bicarbonate, nothing. So, okay. uh, so simple. there is one uh, question uh, from Usha. So if you can make, again explain in only two or three lines, what is the importance of SID concept? Again, more than 24 and less than 24. Just for their take okay. home. I'm ready to do it a number of times. No problem. So um, uh, the SIG name, I, and I was talking about the SID. SID is the strong ion difference of a particular solution. If the strong ion difference of a particular solution is less than the bicarbonate of the patient, after infusion of that particular solution, it will produce metabolic acidosis. For example, a 0.9% saline has an SID of zero. Sodium minus chloride is zero. So if you give 0.9% saline to any patient, it will produce metabolic acidosis because this is always below the less than the bicarbonate of, a, uh, of uh, anybody. The bicarbonate can never be zero. In contrast, if you give SID of Ringa lactate is 27. SID of Ringa lactate is 27, which, is, which can be either more than the uh, bicarbonate of a patient or less than the bicarbonate of the patient, depending upon the baseline bicarbonate of the patient. For example, for a healthy male, say for example, Dr. Gunadhar Pali, he has got a bicarbonate, normal bicarbonate of 24. Now, if we give two liters of Ringa lactate to my friend Gunadhar, since his baseline bicarbonate is 24, which is less than the SID of Ringa lactate, it will produce metabolic alkalosis on him. In contrast, if the two, two liters of Ringa lactate is given to a patient of COPD, whose baseline bicarbonate is 36 or maybe 35 or maybe 40 bicarbonate is high. That is more than the SID of the Ringa lactate. You give Ringa lactate two liters, it will produce metabolic acidosis. So this is how I hope it is clear, Usha. Fantastic. So if I can summarize in, uh, uh, in only the, uh, in the gist, so we have three approaches. One is the traditional approach, Anderson Hesselbach approach, and Stewart's approach. So in Anderson Hesselbach approach, we can either have metabolic acidosis, which can be high NN gap or normal NN gap. And in Stewart's approach, we just have one, we can determine whether the patient is acidotic or patient is having alkalemia. That is the that is the simplest way to approach. And always, whenever you approach the patient with uh, Stewart's approach, basically what we look at is the strong ion difference, SID. So we determine the SID and as per the patient bicarbonate, if you're giving some fluid, then you determine whether that fluid is going to cause acidosis or alkalosis to that particular patient. If the SID is more than bicarbonate of the patient, then it is going to be cause alkalosis to that particular patient. If the SID is less than the bicarbonate of the patient, it is going to cause the acidosis for that particular patient. And to the bottom line is, in every approaches, the respiratory problems, usually they don't vary, if, if I'm not wrong. Yes. It is always acute respiratory or chronic respiratory problem. 
but only the metabolic problems are different approaches in different acid base approach. That is what Dr. Ghosh actually described nicely. So I appreciate. Thank you. I hope my students got some benefit out of this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Students have written thank you and really on behalf of um, Department of Critical Care Apollo Hospital, I we thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for your valuable um, you know inputs on understanding the strong and difference, which thank is you. less understood. And uh, students have definitely got benefit. <coughs> Hope to see you more often than this, and uh, the students will be delighted oh, yeah. to see you again. So, and, can we extrapolate the lectures uh, further to uh, just to have some more interesting concept, uh, Dr. Sukradip? If you can have more lectures on this in the next month or coming months for us. Uh, uh, you want me to talk about the steward again? Uh, just the extended version of the steward, how to like. Uh, uh, like the fluid therapy and I think you have a good uh, recorded lecture on fluid therapy on many of the social uh, networking platform. You yeah, and hyponatremia is really misunderstood. So that can also be Talk a good about the fluid therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one is one question is can we please post a recorded video? Of course, we can post and uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channels, Apollo Mumbai Critical Care Learning Network. We are uploading the video slowly. So uh, you can get all those recordings with the permission of our speaker there also, if you don't mind, of course. I'm 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 fine with that. Thank you, thank you. So just subscribe to our channels. So hope with this uh, we can week. wind up today's session. Next week's session. Yeah, next week's session will be on artificial intelligence on critical care by Dr. Srinivas Sambhavadam. So hope to see you soon on the next Friday, seven thirty. Sir, if you are available, I also share the link with you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.